Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And today I'm chattering with John McNaughton. Good evening, John. Good evening, or good afternoon. Oh, I was gonna... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, good you'd think I'd know by now, but that's, um, yeah. That, well, good, good evening to all the, you know, the UK uh, attendees. Yes, all the UK, Europe. I think we've possibly got one or two. Um, Wherever else is in the evening time zone. Yeah, yeah. May you be, may you be legion. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm, normally I would make a whole load of announcements and so on, but I'm really not, just not going to worry about that this week because I'll, I'll save them all for the end of the show. Um, so I thought we'd just crack, uh, we, we crack on. And, and the first thing we wanted, you wanted to talk about was King of Counterfeit. Now, counterfeit, counterfeit, yes. counterfeit. It, in the, uh, you know, I don't know if it's pronounced differently uh, in, in where they speak real English. <laughs> but, uh, in the United States, it's counterfeit. Counterfeit, yeah. Even it's spelled feet. Yeah, I, I, think kind of, it, I think it just depends on the context. I'm probably just mucking it up terribly. Okay, so tell King of Counterfeit, you've been working on this for eight, eight years? years. Uh, eight years ago, Bill Murray called me up, and we have made three films together uh, and got to be pretty good friends and uh, like working together. So he called me and said, I have this script I, I really like, and I want you to read it, and if you like it, I want you to direct it. And he would, you know, there was a part for him playing a crooked lawyer, of course, and uh, also uh, he, he is a producer. And, you know, we were speaking and he said, you know, at this point in my life, I'm starting to think about producing. So great. And, you know, and I, I, I think I hurt his feelings a little bit because I said, Bill, that's great. We'll work on this. All I need you to do is like make four phone calls a week. And, you know, he was kind of, one, well, I want to do producing, you know, for, but the thing is, Bill Murray at the time was eight, eight, over eight years ago. So George Bush was still president. And I said, you know, Bill, you can call the Pope and the Pope would take your call. You can call George Bush and pick, you can call anybody in the world and they will answer. You know, that's one of the greatest things any producer would, would kill for that ability because you can call any actor, any, you know, anyone will take Bill Murray's call. So we did a lot of work on the project. And, and Linda Cardellini, I don't know if you know Linda Cardellini, she's, uh, she's an American actress, wonderful actress, but she was in Freaks and Geeks when she was a kid with uh, James Franco and whomever else was in that show. And then she was on, she did, all, you know, she was on ER for many seasons. And then she was, you know, she's, she's on some hitch cable show now. She's a great actress. And uh, she sent the script to Bill and their friends. So we cast, like I said, eight years ago, we cast her as Nick, the girl. <clears throat> and today, eight years later, she's playing Nick's mother. And we also have Josh Hutcherson from The Hunger Games playing the young, the young man. And like I say, tomorrow I'll be having a conversation with the uh, producers and the uh, foreign sales company, uh, Lotus Entertainment, who will be financing. And we're, you know, we've, we've narrowed down our... We, we need a, someone to play the, the girl now that Cardellini is playing the woman. <laughs> so we will be uh, discussing that tomorrow and then starting to make offers to uh, actresses. So when do you hope to start filming? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> see, I get into Lindy's on, well, I can't remember the name of the TV show she's on. It's, uh, it's quite successful. So we have to, you know, fit it into her schedule and then weather, you know, depending where we're now talking about shooting it in Puerto Rico and for Miami. So uh, I guess we're safe uh, seasonally in Puerto sure. Rico if that's where we shoot it. So, but the sooner the better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but these things always just, you know, independent filmmaking these days is, I mean, like I say, I consider myself a relatively intelligent person and I'm pretty good at figuring things out, but I have yet to figure out how to get a film made. It, it just sort of happens by miracle. And do, and do you you regard yourself as an independent filmmaker? Not that I'm happy to work for the studios. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made Mad Dog and Glory for Universal. I made Wild Things for uh, Sony Columbia. And I, I really like to be able to do both. I mean, when you're working for the studios, the pay is really good. 
<laughs> and you know, the all the perks are wonderful, uh, and you know, you you are treated like uh, a pasha. You know, when you travel and you you have drivers and Cadillacs or Lincolns, and you have you know, it's a really posh lifestyle, and I am not opposed to it at all. But uh, these days, uh, I don't have any studio perks. Yeah, yeah, but you've you've also done TV stuff yeah. as well. So I presume that is necessarily for studios rather than independent TV. Well, these, you know, I mean, uh, the last TV I did was an episode of a show called John from Cincinnati. That was uh, the showrunner was the the uh, infamous David Milch, who is one of the most brilliant. Uh, you know, like I said, I know a lot of really brilliant people and have worked with them, but. There's only one I would say just might be a true genius because Hollywood geniuses are like, you know, uh, dollar bills. There's millions of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Everyone's a genius in Hollywood. But David is one of the most, if not the most brilliant man I've ever known. Very unusual character, <laughs> I must say. But yeah, last thing I did was uh, an episode of John from Cincinnati and my uh, good friend and and often collaborator, Kem Nunn, a novelist, and now he's got his own TV show now called uh, Chance, starring what's his name from House? What's the British actor? Yes, I, I can picture him entirely, yeah. and his name is oh. uh, 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 Fry and Laurie, Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. Anyway, Kem Nunn and I, Kem Nunn did a lot of work on Wild Things, and we worked on many scripts together, so Kem Nunn, grew up as a kid in Southern California and was a surfer and they HBO decided they wanted to set the John from Cincinnati show in the world of surfing for whatever reason. So David Milch brought Kem Nunn in and he became the co-creator of that show. So that was the last TV show I did for HBO. Uh, and I've developed, I have developed a television show myself, uh, based on a book a friend wrote that takes, he was a cab driver here in Chicago, but he's an artist. So he had one foot in each world. And uh, it was really a wonderful book called Hack. And so right. I optioned that and, you know, the adventures he had while driving ca cabs were in Chicago at night were pretty good. And his, you know, I collect art. So I have, I, when I'm done here, I'm going to a gallery because a friend of mine's having a book signing, but he's one of our Chicago's more prominent artist named Tony Fitzpatrick. So I'm, I'm pretty well wired into Chicago's art community and there's very interesting characters in, in that world too. So. And um, sorry, sorry, a little bit of feedback in my ear, so I'll carry on. Um, but the other project you were telling me about is Carney Kill. But you, you've been working on that even longer than eight years. Yeah, 30 years. <laughs> Or close to 30 years, 1987, no, 20, what is 29. It? 29 years. Yeah. Uh, as I said, when I finished Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, I got, uh, I, have, I have an old and dear friend I went to school with, her name is Elka Titus, and she was working for NHK, Japan National Broadcasting in New York in those days. And uh, she sent me this book, Carney Kill, and the reason she sent it to me is because I used to be in a traveling car. I worked in a traveling carnival when I was a younger man and was very versed in the carnival life and the craziness of it all. And uh, so she sent me this book and it's a, it's a noir thriller uh, B movie type story that was published, I think in <laughs> this book. It was published in 1964 originally, I think, uh, and then republished by Black Lizard Press, who published all Jim Thompson's uh, books. So I optioned the book in 1987 and adapted it. The, I wrote the screenplay and pushed it around for years and uh, didn't get it made. But last year I was invited to pitch pro a project at the uh, Frontiers co-production market in Montreal, which is part of, uh, what's the big Montreal festival? It's just wrapping up right now. <laughs> yeah. The genre festival. It's like the best. It's the best genre festival in North America. It's a fabulous festival. But uh, they have a market called the Frontier uh, Co-Production Market, and they invite. I don't know. Last year, I think they invited twenty projects, but they have you know three hundred buyers in a and you and you do a, a visual presentation in their auditorium, and then you go and it's like speed dating. You spend two days in these 
in this room and you have a table and then every one of the buyers who wants to talk to you signs up and every one of the buyers you want to talk to you sign up and then you get 20 minutes 20 minutes and just like for two days solid you just pitch 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 so <clears throat> we did through you know it's funny I uh, we did a good response from these these uh, three guys in Toronto who are producing they're producing a picture with Dario Argento uh, currently and they contacted me and we had a Skype and you know they have access to all the very there's so many uh, production funds in in Canada uh, government you know funding schemes and uh, they are been working with uh, those departments in in the Canadian government for, for numerous years to and, and they have it pretty well wired so we had a long, long and nice conversation, and then okay, and blah blah blah. And then I didn't hear from him again till last week, ten months later. Oh, where you know, John? How good? Blah blah. So we're, <laughs> and it was fine. What do you? Know? Yeah, but they have been working on the project, and and you know, maybe it'll it'll be shot in Canada uh -huh. uh, with Canadian you know government backing, and then we'll have to raise, but we'll have to raise ever so much less because you know they can raise quite a bit of money through. Uh, like I say, that you know, this province's uh, films, you know, subsidy, and this province, you know, and then the national, you know, tax rebate and blah blah blah. So uh, I'm I'm optimistic that these guys are pretty sharp and will be moving forward with this project also. Right, that sounds really fascinating. And how did you become a carny in the? First well, my instance? life went to pure shit. When I was 26, I was married. I was working in an advertising agency, I had, and and all of a sudden, everything just went to hell. And I literally found myself. I spent one night of my life homeless, sleeping in the bushes. I had um, I, I was basically tossed out by my wife, my best friend, and my parents uh, over the course of about two weeks. I literally had no place to go, and. Uh, I finally found a friend who took me in, who was one of the Frankie Colangelo, who was, uh, was you know, was was basically kicked out of high school and told he could either, you know, when he was seventeen, he could either go to the military or to jail. He had his choice. He went to the military. He was a rough, tough character, but he was <clears throat> he was my benefactor and gave me a place to stay when I had none. And we had a mutual friend named Dave Crusell, who grew up in a really bad part of my old neighborhood. And Dave had been living as a hermit in the woods of Missouri <laughs> and happened to uh, run across this group of carnival workers that had bought like 80 acres and set up this little community where they lived during the winter and they built houses and all this stuff. And they invited him to join the carnival and he was traveling through Chicago. And like I say, I had, I had a, a Canon 35 millimeter camera and like you know two pairs of jeans and, and a pair of shoes and three t-shirts and a jacket to my name and Dave said oh you know hey John I'm going to join the carnival why don't you come with and I was going to say that sounds really good you know and and I went and I got a job and made a living and I had an insane adventure all through the United States and Canada and the Canadian government because the carnival I worked with was the biggest in North America they had their own train uh, and you know, literally a hundred semi trucks and trailers. The Canadian government took umbrage with the fact that they had been not paying their taxes for a number of years, and they raided us twice. And I never had so many guns stuck in my face. They took everything. They took the trucks. They took the tents. They took, you know, we had a, the only vehicles that were left to us were the personal vehicles of the workers. And you know, we had to limp back across the uh, Canadian border into the United States and just beg, borrow, and steal to to rebuild the thing and start over. And it was a tremendous adventure. I have lots of photographs that I took uh, during that time. Wow. Wow. It's quite a, so how did that lead into filmmaking? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a long story. Uh, after, let's see, after I was done with the carnival, I landed in New Orleans and I had good friends there. Uh, some of my, you know, really good troublemaking partners uh, were living in New Orleans. And that time New Orleans was just kind of paradise for, you know, it was 24 hour the bars were open 24 hours. Like I say, uh, I, you know, and I was usually in one of them till the sun came up. Uh, but I got this tremendous job uh, working as a silversmith. And I learned to be a silversmith and a stone cutter. 
uh, which was tremendous. Uh, I, I loved doing that so much. And uh, then that all sort of fell apart, and we kind of grabbed all the there, – there was a foreclosure on the shop we were working in by these – these Italians from New York <laughs> because they owned the building and they tried to seize the equipment and we got there first. And so we rented a truck and, and loaded the truck up with all the, all the, you know, stone cutting wheels and the, and the saws and the, the workbenches and everything and loaded them into it. And, and they, ch they literally chased us with the cops. We had to go over the Mississippi river bridge. And I, I actually, it was hiding out for like two weeks with the, and, and then it blew over and came back to the city. And then I set up my own silversmithing uh, operation for a while. and Didn't quite, you know, make enough money to survive. And then I uh, got a job building sailboats, big racing sailboats, uh, which was really fun too. And then I left New Orleans after a couple of years, after I got in a fist fight with my best friend at four in the morning over a girl. And, uh, and I started standing in the street, you know, and he'd ripped the t-shirt off of me. And he was, you know, my very dear friend and is to this day. Uh, and I just thought, you know what? It's four in the morning. I'm standing in the middle of the street in New Orleans with my t-shirt torn off of me in a fist fight with my best friend, drunk. It's time to go home. Yeah. I mean, okay, this is sort of the end of my New Orleans event. And I went back to Chicago oh, and, and I rented a truck again and took my possessions. And there's a few of them that I brought back from New Orleans in this part in this place here where I live. But I called my cousin who had a bar on the south side of Chicago before I drove back to from New Orleans to Chicago and I said, I'm coming back to New Orleans. I have, you know, I have enough money for gas. <laughs> but I need a job. So uh, I came back to Chicago, and I had literally a ten dollar bill and some loose change in my to my name, and uh, stayed with my parents, and that was really miserable. But I went to uh, went to work for my cousin in his bar, and while I was working in his bar, I met this guy who was basically drunk who was work, working part time for this company called MPI. Well, it wasn't even called MPI; that was called Maljack. Two brothers from Jordan who whose family had come to Chicago in 1966. They, the dad saw that the 67 war was on the horizon uh, and moved the family to America. And uh, these two brothers, Walid and Malik, started this little ragtag business renting projectors to you know, hotel conference rooms. But the, Walid, who's deceased, he died of cancer a number of years ago, was, was a real visionary, a really brilliant guy. And so I went to work for them delivering prints, uh, well, actually, eight millimeter loops, uh, one hour loops that they would rent to these. Uh, they would install these these cheap projectors that play these eight out these one hour loops of public domain, old cartoons, Charlie Chaplin, anything old and free. <laughs> And I was the guy that would go and t pick up the print off one machine and take it to the next place. And when I was at this place, I would take from the last one and drive on this big route. And I did that for a year while I was working full time at the bar and got to be friends with the Ali brothers. But it really didn't seem to be leading anywhere. But we had, dream we had a dream, myself and Waleed. One day, we're going to make a movie. Okay. So I left their employ and I, I was pretty skilled at carpentry, so I became a union carpenter and wound up remodeling Burger Kings for, but it paid really well. And I was able to go remodel a Burger King for like six, eight weeks that it would take. And then I would have enough money to live from, you know, uh, and, and try and get myself into the, you know, uh, to become a filmmaker. And I did that for what, then one day I got a call from Waleed and, uh, I went out to visit them. They were out in the suburbs. I was living in a really great old loft in the city. And we uh, agreed to make these documentaries called Dealers in Death, which were uh, about Chicago gangsters. And there was one that was just about Chicago gangsters. And the other one was called Dealers in Death Hollywood Crime Wave. And it was about gangster movies. So we made the first one. Uh, and we, we were, you know, there's there's tons of of public domain footage of real gangsters, photographs, and we hired Broderick Crawford to narrate it, who was towards the end of his days. And so we, you know, the Ali brothers by this time had gone into video cassette distribution. They were like in on the first week. And 
they were buying a lot. They were, you know, finding a lot of stuff in the public domain, duplicating it, selling it, and they were starting to make some money. So we made these documentaries. They sold them. They did pretty well. And we were going to then do some more. And I was in for a meeting with Waleed and we were going to do these documentaries on wrestling because we'd found all this old footage, but the deal got messy. And he said, John, you know, let's, we don't want to deal with those people that own this wrestling footage. They're trying to rip us off. Why don't we remember our dream to make them? He said, I'll give you $100,000 to make a horror film. I mean, this came from Sky Blue. And he said, can you make a film for $100,000? And I, you know, I've since, since, if he would have said, can you make a film for $10? I would have not blinked and said, absolutely. And those, so $100,000. <clears> And I left Waleed's office, and all it was was, I don't care what it is, it's a horror film, because they were, they were licensing B-horror films, drive-in movies that, that were not, you know, that a lot of people, you know, they weren't big, uh, well-distributed films. That They were films that were kind of, you know, uh, like I say, B, what would the word be today? Uh, outsider film, et cetera, et cetera, small horror films that, and they would license them for whatever, however much, and then sell them. And they were, they were very profitable in the early days of video. But then the owners of such films started going, well, you know, the price started to go up for the rights acquisition. So while he, you know, and then it would be, oh, you only get North America. You only get this. You don't get television, blah, blah, blah. While he just said, finally, I'll give you $100,000 and we'll own, we'll own this picture, Lock, Stock, and Barrel to perpetuity, all rights. So... That was, you know, as I say, as I was leaving his office, I was sort of on a cloud because I did not, you know, this came really out of the blue. And down the hall in their building was a, uh, a guy that sat in an office and he was a, someone I'd grown up with and played in rock and roll bands and basically put, you know, hooked up, hooked him up with the Ali brothers that got him this job that he now had. And he was sort of the archivist of the, the strange, the arcane, the weird. And he had stacks and stacks of uh, VHS cassettes with all sorts of crazy stuff from, that he gleaned from all over. And again, we had known each other since first grade. Uh, he grew up around the corner from me. And his name is Gus. He still, still walks this earth. So I walked into his office and I said, Gus, well, he just gave, offered me 100 grand to make a movie. I go a horror movie. I, he goes, well, yeah, what is it good? What are you going to what do you, what's the subject? I go, I don't know. He goes, so we didn't discuss that. Part. And so he said, here, let me show you something. And he, and he used to always smoke Viceroy cigarettes. I mean, there's always a cloud of smoke in that room when he was in. He reached over and pull, pulled his video cassette off a pile and stuck it in the machine and up comes the TV show 2020, which is a news documentary show. And there was, and it was, you know, they generally have two or three stories in a one hour show. And there was a 20 minute segment on Henry Lee Lucas. Uh, and that was the first time I heard the term serial killer. The FBI, I think, had coined the, the uh, that uh, phrase in like 1984 or 85, I think. And it was anyway, it was, a, you know, 20 minutes worth of Henry Lee Lucas and his, his uh, assistant, his sidekick, Otis Elwood Tool. His real name had a double T, and it was not Otis, it was Otis. So uh, I just watched this, and there was pictures of the real guys, and I just went, this is it. This is horror, and, you know, here's our story. So, you know, then... Steve Jones, who I was talking to you earlier, mm -hmm. we still work together 31 years later. Uh, I knew him because through he was friends with friends of mine. And they all played music in those days. and But he was working as a director of animation. He did the Captain Crunch commercials. And uh, but he was very well connected in the world of production in Chicago, where I really was not. And so I asked him for recommendations, and we started putting together the group. And the first one that came aboard was the writer, Richard Fire. And Richard was an actor and a writer, and he had been like second in command of a group called the Organic Theater in Chicago, and that was Stuart Gordon's company. Right. And amongst that company was Dennis Farina, Dennis Franz, Joey Montaigne. Uh, they worked with Mamet. I mean, you know, it was a... And, and, it was a really great group, and they had this huge hit play in Chicago 
called ER. And that's where it comes from. Right. And it ran for years. And, you know, they, I mean, when those guys, they, they used to improvise their shows. They had some great shows, but they would, they did one called Bleacher Bums about the Chicago Cubs. And they would, you know, they would all go to the Cubs games and hang out with these goofs that would just literally would bet on where a fly was going to land. They would bet on every pitch. They would bet on every swing of the bat. And they were just dege- what, what it's called, we call in America, degenerate gamblers. And they improvised this. Then they would go back to the theater and they improvised it and they came up with the show Bleacher Bums. It was a huge hit. It went to L.A. It ran for 13 consecutive years. Wow. And Mayor Bradley declared a bleacher bums day in Los Angeles. It was such a, you know. So anyway, they were really gifted. But when they started out, they were so broke and poor. Literally, when they would open a show, as people were buying tickets, they would take the box office money and, and send someone out to buy the props because they couldn't afford they couldn't afford them until until they got. But they became successful, and they, you know, and and ER was a smash hit. Hollywood came calling, bought an option on the material. And I think there were eight of them that were credited as writers. So they each got like in those days, like I, I, I hit, yeah, I'm guessing about 25 grand. Well, of course they were at each other's throats within a week, you know, once they made a nickel and uh, the whole company just, you know, imploded and they were, and some of them, you know, Stuart got, that's when Stuart hooked into reanimator and went off and, you know, started a film career. But some of them weren't so lucky yet. And Richard was kind of, Richard Fire was at loose ends. So Steve Jones knew him and said, you know, you need a co-writer. Here's, this guy's good. And so Richard and I wrote the screenplay and Richard was good. Richard is the cra- one of the craziest sons of bitches I've ever known. Unfortunately died last year, but really a fun character, really gifted. And uh, so we wrote the script and at his apartment and uh, had a pretty good time doing it as I remember. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, and then uh, Waleed was good to his word, gave us the money. We cast it with uh, Tom Tolls came out of the Organic Theater. He was a member of the per- permanent company. Uh, Tracy Arnold had been working. They, they moved ER after it had a two-year run. They moved it to a suburban theater and, and put a new, installed a new cast so that the permanent company members could do something new. And Tracy was one of the people out at the... Uh, the new cast, and and so Richard knew her and knew her work, and said, "I know someone who's really good." Well, so we brought Tracy, and we cast her as Becky. We th- we brought Tommy in, thinking he might play Henry, but the minute I I didn't know Tommy, but after sitting with her for, I go, "No, this guy's Otis." <laughs> he, he just <laughs> trust me, Richard. This guy's Otis, and uh, and then Michael Rooker came uh, from. Uh, this our make we had hired a makeup artist named Jeff Siegel and he had directed some theater and he'd worked with Michael Rooker in some play. So uh, Richard Fire was not terribly fond of Jeff Siegel. So Jeff Siegel says, "I know this actor. He's really great. I worked in this play." And Richard just said, "No, <laughs> no." <laughs> it was a personal thing between them. And after you know uh, later, I said, "You know, Richard, what do we got to lose? You know, let's see this guy." And so I talk Richard into allowing Michael to audition. And we were working at Richard's apartment, which was up on, uh, right on the lake in a high rise. And we were working one day and there's a knock at the door and I got up, it, I knew who it was. It was his appointed time and I went and I opened the door and there was Rooker wearing the identical clothes he wears in the movie. The only thing we changed was his shoes. <laughs> he wore that Carhartt jacket and the, the work shirt and those blue Dickies work pants. And there was my, I want, I, and I've told the story a thousand times. I said a prayer to myself, oh God, please let him be able to act because this is the guy. I mean, for camera, here's Henry. And he came in and, you know, he was in character. So he was. <laughs> You know, he was. It was not like you were dealing with a normal human being, and uh, but it was just so clear to me that he was. You know, God sent us the right guy, and uh, and when he left, you know, we had the. You know, we talked and this and that, and he he left, and then outside was the hallway and the elevator, and I I stood by the door and I listened till I heard the elevator doors close. I knew he was on, and I ran to the phone and I picked it up, and the woman who was our unit production manager was 
we ran the production out of my apartment and she was in my apartment at the desk. I called her up and I said, book this guy, he's gonna be a movie star. Do not let him get away. So then we had Michael. <clears throat> Is there, is there, a couple of questions are coming in about um, Henry, um, one of which is uh, from Steve Zarebski, uh, who says, what was your favorite and or the hardest scene to film in Henry? Well, my favorite scene is the scene where, where after they've stolen the camera and killed <laughs> <laughs> the guy that was trying to sell it to them. Uh, they do that dance. They're up in the apartment, and and mm. and we we, we a, a, a dear friend of mine is a guy named Steve Stephen Hager, and I see him on Facebook all the time. He was for about twenty five years the editor of High Times Magazine, uh, and he was instrumental in getting us a getting our us our first distribution deal in, in on Henry because. I brought the film to New York. I was staying in his apartment. So, sorry, give, give me the question. Oh, sorry, oh. yeah, so oh. the question, what was your favorite scene to film and which well, the was the hardest? Thing, Steve it, it had started this garage band called the Soul Assassins that was basically a bunch of people from high times. And I would fly in and play keyboards in, in the Lower East Side in New York. We were quite a phenomenon in Manhattan in those days. But Steve was really into garage band rock. And he said, you got to use this song in your movie. And it's called Psycho. And that is the song we used. And we had already chosen it. So when they were dancing, you know, they were dancing to that. Right. But it, it, it just was a kind of a moment out of the, the horror of, the, of the, the whole story where they, you know, they had a moment of grace where they're just dancing and having fun. And it was, it was just a complete improv. And they were, you know, they were all wonderful actors. So, to me, it's, it was the most fun scene. And of course, the most difficult scene was the the home invasion. Hmm. And that was, <clears throat> I mean, the actress had to be taken to the hospital after that scene. She she freaked out, and she because she claimed she strained her neck, but and maybe she did. But my opinion is she was traumatized by it. And, well, you know, Lord knows I tried to, to say this is, you know, she was, her and her husband had moved to Chicago. You know, Chicago has a huge theater scene, vibrant theater scene. And so many actors have, uh, you know, c come up here. And so a lot of people, it's a mecca for, pe for people who want to act and come to Chicago and get started in the theater. And her and her husband had come from Kansas, <laughs> just like Dorothy, and, uh, and they wanted to be in musical theater. You know, and so she came into audition, a really nice person, and it's been so long, I'm, I'm forgetting her name, but I said, you know, this isn't Kansas anymore. I mean, this is going to be really harsh. Oh, no, and she's really nice, and oh, no, I'm fine, you know, it doesn't, I'm, I want to, I'm an actor. You know, so, okay. And we did two takes of that. The first take just didn't, but there were only five people. I think there was her, there was me. There were the actors, Michael and Tommy, and uh, there was the woman who works for me today, her kid, who was like, you know, 14 at the time, plays the kid that walks in. It wasn't even 14. And uh, we had a two-man crew, uh, and one of them was playing the husband with the bag over his head, lying on the floor, grunting. So, you know, there were six or seven people in that room, and uh, Michael actually shot the beginning of that scene with the home video camera and then when the kid came in the door and he went to attack him he drops the camera but the cinematographer Charlie Lieberman was standing behind him and grabbed the camera off his shoulder turned it upside down and laid it on the floor to, so it looks like it's dropped but it it's you know, it was a guided drop and you know aimed to, to film the rest of the scene <clears throat> but after the second shot the second time we we did it Tom Tolls looked at me and he goes I was holding back <laughs> Thank God for that. And uh, I just looked at the people in the room. I said, none of us are going to heaven after shooting this, <laughs> after, after what we just did. And, and as I say, the young uh, lady, the actress, was uh, traumatized. I mean, she, we, she, we did literally take her to the emergency room. Wow, I know. When, I mean, I have to say there is that scene, but the one I found the most disturbing was the killing 
is Otis's first killing at the roadside the good of the Good Samaritan. Oh yeah, the, the Good Samaritan is uh, the person himself. His name is Rick Paul. He was the production designer. And Rick Paul and I are getting ready to do a play. Uh, we've be, remained friends since then and worked on numerous things. And uh, we're going to probably take, uh, I have very good uh, friendship with uh, the person that runs the Jack Kerouac estate. So, uh, you know, they're ask, offering me rights to various of Kerouac's books. And there's a novel, a novella called Tristessa. And I think Rick Paul and I are going to... Uh, put it up here in Chicago shortly, but the character's name, when Richard and I wrote it, it was a good Samaritan, it was a nice guy. We are thinking, nice guy, and Rick Paul is the nicest guy that ever walked. Uh, so let's get Rick to do it. <laughs> so, so Rick played the guy, and uh, the, the, the squibs were sort of homemade. Uh, and you notice when he gets shot like this, this huge flame comes flying out of his chest, which is not what happens with a person. <laughs> no. but, but it's dramatic. So anyway, yeah, that was a, that was a tough day. That was a 26 hour day. <laughs> that, that's interesting. Yeah. I, funny if this kind of leads into, there's two more, more questions on uh, uh, Henry that have come out. Um, the first is from Kim Lehman, who uh, who's wondering about you talking about the writing of of the uh, of the film. Um, whose was the idea that Otis was a comic book collector? Was that just a grace note that happened to be? <laughs> we did that, that. Yeah, that was a uh, like I say. The film people who see it once find it hard to believe, but. It's going to be re-released for the fifth or sixth time uh, in October, and there's going to be a world premiere at Chicago Film Festival, which was one of its first screenings 30 years ago, and it's going wow. to be have a, a you know big publicized screenings in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, but if you watch the film three times, say it's very funny. We we were just working on the restoration, and I hadn't seen it for a long time, so we're sitting doing the color correction, we're sitting doing the audio work. And I'm with Steve Jones, who was the producer. And like I say, we still, you know, I was over at his house last night with Irvin Welsh, who wrote Train Spotting and his wife. And, uh, you know, we're working on a project with Irvin, actually. We're, we optioned his book, uh, Sex Lives of Siamese Twins. We got someone writing a screenplay from that. But anyway, uh, Steve and I, you know, a couple months ago, we're just sitting and watching, and we're just tears rolling down. You know, again, there's Otis reading, and Tommy. Tommy's performance is is basically a comic performance. It, it's a, just a, a buff, you know a clown, mm. uh, but a, you know a, a bestial clown. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy was very funny, and so yeah, we just you know this is the level. And one of my favorite lines in the movie is when Becky, and it's on my Facebook page. Becky walks in with a T-shirt because she's been shopping. And says I, and then red heart. Chicago and Henry go, turns and Otis goes nice and <laughs> and Henry looks and he goes yeah nice what's it say on there <laughs> well illiterate, you know yeah, and yeah. Think Otis it's like this is you know this is his reading level comic books I mean that's as far as you know that's the most that Otis has ever read so I don't think he was ever any so ambitious to be a collector. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you just set, but the question comes in from a, a filmmaker friend of mine, uh, Paddy Murphy, um, uh, who I've just have done a I've done a short film with him recently, and has had done a really. If you get a chance to see a short film called The Cheese Box, it's not horror, but it's one of the most mo moving short films I've seen all in the last 12 months. Um, Paddy was asking, was it difficult or maybe perfect to work with somebody like Michael who was so fully method in the role or was it intimidating or? No, Michael was deep into character. It's interesting. Uh, I'm, you know, friends with him. I maintain a friendship with him and, uh, and his wife, Margot, and uh, they're still married, which is, you know, pretty damn good for a, a movie actor for over 30 years. But uh, unbeknownst to Michael, 
his wife was pregnant with their first child while we were shooting the movie, and she wouldn't tell him till he came out of character, till the till the shoot was over. <laughs> he didn't find he didn't get the news till we were done shooting Henry. But it was Michael came up really hard in Alabama in a little town called Jasper, Alabama, and they were poor, mm. and and. and uh, his parents split up and he came to Chicago with his father and his father was like, you know, was like, a, he ran errands for a mobster in Cicero, Illinois, basically. And uh, Michael was just a very determined guy that uh, in high school was a, was, a, was a gifted athlete, a football player, but I think he was dyslexic. So in order to, to conquer, get overcome his dysle dyslexia, he started acting, you know, high school dramas. Uh, uh, Michael, you know, he was in character, but 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 his background was really rough. And, and one time, I don't know if I asked him or someone asked him. And it wasn't no, it wasn't me. Michael, how do you how did you do that character? He goes, Oh, I had an uncle that was just like this guy. So. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I, I was talking to Jen and Sylvia Soska, uh, my friends, uh, the other day, who are friends of Michael as well, and they say, you know, how come you play such bad evil characters and he said i've never played a bad evil character <laughs> and i just thought yeah you've just played him as a human being you've yeah, just yeah. yeah yeah in their own you know all these characters you play they're not bad or evil in their own mind well like the best villains are, are you know have some shred of decency i mean again what i always say otis is kind of you know right off the bat you see that in the movie we said okay there's a string of corpses okay who did this mm. who did it henry you know it's it, there's no mystery waiting to find out. This is the yeah. guy, and he walks into the house, and with the guitar, where'd you get that guitar? Oh, picked it up. Well, obviously, there's a corpse that used to own that guitar. But, you know, so right off the bat, you know this guy's a murderer. And traditionally, it's going to be like, okay, we hate him. He's bad. He's the bad guy. We don't like him. But Otis is so vile, as, he, <laughs> as Henry schools him, that Otis, you know, uh, Michael has got the beast inside him, but he's got some decency left. But Otis gives himself over to the beast, and he becomes the mirror that, you know, Henry can, re reflects the, the decency of Henry. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Otis will, will, you know, go after his own sister, but Henry stops him. She's your sister. There is a line. Henry yeah. still has a line of, that he won't cross. Otis... Get, Otis gives himself to the beast. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Henry, you know, that's one of the great tricks of the film is like any movie is like you're looking for Hollywood's term, the relatable character, the, the character you root for. And you're watching this movie and the first, you know, you, you here comes Henry and well, obviously he's a murderer. Who am I going to root for? And little by little, it's you find yourself, you're rooting for Henry. And yeah. then you're in a really uncomfortable place, you know. Yeah wait a minute this is the bad guy but i like him <laughs> yeah yeah and i think yes yeah it's one of the things about the charm of, of uh, michael okay the, we, <laughs> as i suspected we, we've spent quite a bit of time on henry uh, we, you've got an awful lot of other films we could talk about so i got there are a couple of questions i really wanted to ask you um Obviously, you've explained how you kind of got into filmmaking and so on. One of the things I find really fascinating about your work is sometimes the lack of dialogue. Um, I was watching The Harvest this afternoon, and I spotted, I, you know, can see elements of it again in Lansky. You have long periods where there are just no dialogue. I'm thinking particularly in The Harvest, where you've got the father looking at the album of the photographs of the child, and you, he doesn't say a word. There's, I can't remember if there is any music particularly in the scene, but probably it's... music. There. I'm probably, I, I love music and use it. The, the harvest has a lot of music. In fact, we had after we scored it, and we were in the, you know, actually in the uh, mixing, and I started throwing music out. I'm going, I got music overload. Uh, just, you know, we don't need to have music always. I worked with the same composer that I've worked with many times, uh, George Clinton, and love his work. But we just had too much music. But there, I'm, I'm pretty certain there's music, and that's a place. If there's no dialogue, chances are I'm putting music in, in there. Right. Funnily enough, a, a, comp a composer friend of mine as well, um, Eric, uh, uh, Eric Alec. I've got the name. Yes, I've got his name, Eric Alec. Um, 
it, I think you've just answered that question. How do you like working with composer? How do you work together? Well, uh, I you know played music when I was a kid, so I'm a great lover of music, and uh, I like I work with all the the creative heads, department heads, whether it be cinematographer, or costume designer, or uh, production designer. It's you know I, I I know the game, especially if they've been Hollywood. You know, worked a lot in Hollywood and. You're going to work with a certain amount of directors that have a very specific, you know, oh, I want just exactly that. And they'll just like really put those people in a box where they, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can't really stretch out and do the work they, they would love to do. They have ideas and they go, now make it like this, the way I've been thinking about it. And it's like, I always tell the, the people, my collaborators, the creative clubs, this is the movie where you're going to, you know, all the times you've been sort of denied and squashed and, 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 prevented from doing the, the thing you would love to do because you have because you've been doing this for a long time and you're here because you love doing it uh, I'm the guy that's gonna let you do that so I want your what I want from you is the stuff that the other people didn't let you do you know I want your best and then we'll shape it but you know go for it give me your best and I, I worked a lot with George Clinton uh, and again, one of the great thrills to me, and, and it happens so much less now, is, is working in the, the, the couple of days you get in a full recording studio with an, with an orchestra. That, to me, is the biggest thrill. Of, when I was a kid, I played piano, <clears throat> and I played a certain amount of film themes and film music, and I kept seeing every, certain pieces that I go, wow, this is really good. You know, who wrote this? It would be the same, per so many times it was the same person, a guy named Elmer Bernstein, who wrote, you know, everything, 200 films, won the Academy Award, uh, got filthy rich because he wrote the movie, the, the music from Magnificent Seven, which became the Marlboro cigarette theme, and, and which ran for 20 years, like, you know, consistently, and every time it ran, which was like a thousand times a day, Elmer got paid, you know, and it was an amazing gold mine for him. But he was a lovely, lovely man. And we did Mad Dog and Glory. He was friends with Martin Scorsese, who was the producer. So I got to work with Elmer Bernstein. And I, I you know, I mean, I worked with Bob De Niro, and it was like, uh, weren't you intimidated? I go, well, a little bit, but he was always so nice to me that, you know, it, it went away quickly. Bill Murray, I go, Bill was, you know, not that difficult to work with. And no one really intimidated me. The idea of working with Elmer Bernstein sort of awed me. And when we got in there, we were we recorded the music in the uh, old RCA recording studios, which is one of the greatest recording studios in the world, now gone. Uh, Elvis recorded in the, those studios. The Toscanini, who who conducted the NBC uh, studio orchestra, one of the great you know conductors of the twenties, that's where they recorded and. It was the RCA Studios, which was NBC and RCA were affiliated, and everybody recorded in that studio. And to sit in that studio with Elmer Bernstein and like, you know, a 60-piece orchestra it was beyond anything that else that I've ever done. And it was just so fabulous. But we're, you know, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a 60-piece orchestra on Henry, but we were probably one of the first scores ever to use uh, samples. Uh, because the guys, the two guys that did the score, Ken Hale, who I still work with in Chicago, and Robert McNaughton, who is someone I is not a direct. I'm sure we're related somewhere back in the you know in the clans of Scotland somewhere, but I had never met him till we'd done Henry, and uh, but that was just done all electronically. And but Ken Hale had the first sampling keyboard that was available to the public. And it was really dirty in its sound, but we put in all those screams and glass smashes and dentist drills. We, we got all those sound samples and, and worked them into the score. And it was kind of like the first time that it had really been done. So I love scoring. It's one of it's like frosting the cake to me. It's like the film is the film, but when you add the score, that's when it it really comes alive. Mm. It and when you work, uh, as I say, one of the things I really love about your work is the fact that sometimes you just have big stretches where there is no dialogue. Is that part of the script when you're working with the screenwriter? Is, or do you just think, you know, here, this is a moment where we can do this? So. It, sometimes it's, it's written in. Uh, you know, there's just, and sometimes it's just of the moment. It's, it was interesting. When we did The Harvest, 
I was working with Samantha Morton and and uh, why am I blanking on his name? He's one of our best actors in the world today, Michael. Yes, and if you give me two seconds, I shall be able to tell you because I actually did a little bit of research. Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon, who came up in Chicago in basically garage theater. Uh, you know, those are, uh, you know, the, it doesn't get better in terms of skill, uh, acting gift and skill than those two. I mean, mm. De Niro and Bill Murray, yeah, okay, yes. It doesn't, you know, but that's the plateau. And, and you know, Michael and uh, Samantha had known each other. And, I mean, it, it was not a, a, a really, you know, it was a hard shoot because they were playing – you know, the, you know the story. Yeah, the, what the, I mean, the, no one wanted that role. Samantha took it because she's the bravest thing that ever walked. But who wants to be a mother that's going to take this thing, this kid that you think's her child? She's going to, you know, literally cut its heart out. Uh, that's not a, a, a place a lot of actresses want to go, especially if they had children. And Samantha at that point had two. Now she has three. And Michael has a daughter also. So. Michael generally plays, you know, villainous characters. And to play basically a weakling was very difficult for him. And the way the character was written, it was like it wasn't clear because the, the guy wasn't clear. The, the, the character wasn't clear. He's, he's, he really loves this child, but yet he's enabling her to, to do this, you know. And he's really a torn and weak and f fucked up guy. So they're playing two really horrible, horrible characters. And, you know, Michael, uh, it just, he's, you know, and she's very method. And it, 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 you, you wind up starting to live with, have to live with those people. But they're, uh, they had worked together before and they were friends. And, and, and I, I will say, and that's, you know, I think that script has a wonderful plot, but the dialogue wasn't the strong part of it. And every morning I'd come in and they'd be sitting there work together with this. And, they, and, and immediately, though, well, I'm not saying this. You know, and then she go no, and I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying. I, I'm not. I, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so the dialogue's flying out the window on the harvest. I mean, but they were so. You know, the reason was that they didn't need that dialogue. You know, to to tell to to portray what needed to be portrayed, and that's uh, when you have actors that good. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with uh, winnowing the language. I, 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 there is one funny enough, as I was watching The Harvest this afternoon um, upstairs uh, in, in my study where I am now and it just uh, when the plot twists I just said oh god <laughs> Craig, Craig came upstairs to find out what was worrying me <laughs> um, we've got um, we've got limited time John please shout out if we're if, I, we can carry on talking for ages and ages and ages. And, and I'm I still... okay for, for, for now. Uh, like I said, yeah, I mean, I, I have some place. I don't have I, I don't, in about an hour. I have some place to be. Okay. Well, we won't we won't go on for for an hour. I, I hope, but certainly I think we're probably going to go on before our normal allotted hours time because there are, I've got so many questions coming in. Um, one of the questions that are coming about this is again from Paddy um, and Danny. I am going to get to your questions. Uh, I promise you. I have, I have a, a comment from Danny. He he unwittingly gave me a great idea yesterday or the day before when we get there. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> we we'll definitely go. Okay, we'll do Paddy's and we'll come to Danny's questions because right. I'm intrigued now. Um, it feels like uh, Paddy asked. It feels like you enjoy characters who are morally gray. Are characters who aren't on a hero villain more interesting to you as a filmmaker? Are, are these really the, the characters you're interested in? Yeah, I, I am, you know, again, what what interests me is getting to the bottom of what is human. And, the, you know, and I just read uh, an article of Deepak Chopra, who's, not, you know, not somebody I normally read, but uh, it was a piece on Facebook about how it's easy to explain Trump. I don't, you know, I don't know if you ever read Jung, uh, but you know the shadow. Each yeah. of us has a dark side, a shadow that contains, you know, and, and uh, for Freud it was the unconscious. It's where all the dark, murderous, you know, sexually aggressive, just all your your worst urges are in the shadow, and we all have that. And and that's the thing with Henry. It's like face this. Okay, you're sitting here watching this character. Now you are 
you know, the character we identify, who is it? It's him. Because you're, I, I remember seeing a, 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 a drama about Ted Bundy. And, the, you know, Ted Bundy was very charming. And uh, so all these, co he knew a lot of cops. And so in the, in the teleplay, was it made for TV movie, the cops are going, when they first accuse, oh, it couldn't be Ted's such a great guy. Oh, Ted's such a great guy. We love Ted. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear that it, it, he is guilty of these crimes. We hate him. He is bad. Well, this is the guy you thought was okay two days ago, you know? I mean, we the, the, the worst of us, you know, often, the characters that are 100% bad are not interesting. They're just booga booga villains, you know, mm -hmm. ooga booga villains, where, you know, complex, the great, the great villains are complex and have some, you know, some decency in them buried somewhere that makes them interesting and human. And yeah, I, you know, cliche, I just, you know, also avoiding cliche. I mean, I've led a very interesting, varied life, you know, with the, uh, worked all kinds of jobs, knowing people from every social level and uh, people aren't, you know, pure good and pure evil. Nobody is. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's coming to Danny's questions. Oh, Hitler had a <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He was a vegetarian. And, and yes, vegetarian. I was you. Yeah, he was, yeah, was petting his dog. I saw millions of pictures of him, film footage and petting his German Shepherd and being really nice to it, so. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, that's part of the reason they're so terrifying is because yes, you're absolutely, you know, the shadow is in. Again, the character can't think of themselves. You know, mm. I'm bad. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. What I'm doing is, is good. Yeah. And yes, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, one of Danny's questions was, uh, what was your idea for uh, Elm Street First Kills? And would you be interested in pursuing the project? I'd you know, I'd love to do, a, you know, at this point, it would be, if they were to, to undertake to do a Freddy, it could be a, a, a really fabulous uh, piece. But I had, uh, I forget the executive's name. There was an executive at New Line, and he's long since really a nice guy, long since gone off uh, on his own and has his own company. I'm sure he's making films. He's a bright man. Uh, but I had some meetings with them about, you know, doing, and it wasn't First Kills. First Kill, Kills was the script they developed, but I wanted to work with a, uh, a writer named R.J. Tsarov, T-S-A-R-O-V, and he's a wonderful playwright that lives in New Orleans, and I wound up directing a play he'd done uh, here in Chicago. And uh, we got involved with these two women who had the rights to uh, a, a, a famous murder story. There was a, this kid named Rod Farrell who really, you know, under thought he was a vampire. I mean, he really did the whole thing. And he wound up murdering his girlfriend's parents in Florida. Uh, and a brutal, brutal murder. But he, he was very charismatic and very creepy. But he, you know, he sort of brought all these kids into his group, and they would, it would call crossing over. The name of the script is crossover. You cross over into the the dark side, the vampire world. And so he had this little cult, and he, they, you know, traveled around. And eventually, he wanted to go grab his girlfriend and go to New Orleans and be vampires. <laughs> and the pair of parents weren't, weren't down with the idea. So he murdered them brutally. And then they, you know, stole the car and went off to New Orleans. And it was a huge case. And when you saw, this kid was so creepy looking that, hold on, I just realized I don't have, I, I have to uh, plug my computer in or it's going to die shortly. Oh, okay. One sec. <laughs> that, that would be very unfortunate. Okay. So anyway, it was a huge case, and Rod Farrell was all over the news, and he really, and he was unrepentant, and he was out, whenever the cameras would be on him, he'd do some vile, stick out his his tongue or uh, like this, and he, he was just unrepentant, evil young guy. So we developed this script that RJ wrote it called Crossover, and it's really good, because again, you know, like with the, when, when I was asked to make a horror film, it's like, okay, we don't have enough money for fantasy, for monsters, for witches flying, you know, for ghosts, anything. What's really horrific? This is really horrific, real life. And it's like, you know, Twilight, oh, the vampires, oh, they turn into, you know. No, here's what vampirism really amounts to. These deluded idiots that go out and get into this lifestyle and are totally detached from, from reality. And if they go far enough and if they're stupid enough, they'll murder somebody and that's what happened. And this is what vampirism is really like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we couldn't get that made and the script still exists, it's really good. 
Uh, so I wanted, but I'd be developed a relationship with RJ, and he his plays are very unique, but they're dark, incredibly dark. And I thought this guy would be perfect in the horror genre. Well, that you know, the vampire film really was sort of horror in the sense that Henry's horror. This is human beings just you know going giving themselves over to evil. So you know, we had I I, I brought him on board, and we had a you know couple talk. I had a couple conversations with but it never really came to any oh and my other thing was i want to do you know the prequel because freddie originally was the the janitor in the high school yeah that's what i wanted the you know let's leave the supernatural but let's start the movie where the where the first you know what do they do they burn freddie up when they found out you know the the, the backstory that's told in the first film mm. you know, they threw freddie in the furnace and then he went to hell, and now he's, I want to see him get, I want to see that story where he winds up in hell, where they yeah. throw him in the furnace and we follow him down to hell. Yeah. I love the idea of making hell on film. Uh, and it just so happened that, what was that movie with, was it Adam Sandler? Who's the other one? Oh, Little, Little Nicky? Something. And they had a big scene in hell. They had created a hell, and the movie flopped. So of course Hollywood being Hollywood, oh they had hell and little Nicky and it flopped. No, we don't want hell. So it went to hell. It never happened. But I would still love to do Freddie's backstory when he was not a supernatural being. When he was this loser, you know, in, in the local high school. Right, right. So you you mentioned that Danny had sparked an idea um, on a comment that you that's Oh, He'd yeah, I want Danny Stewart to know this, uh, that I was on Facebook the other day, and I, I'm working right now, the pages are sitting over here, I have a friend who wrote, uh, who's written a number of novels that take place in Chicago, and his last novel is called Pursuit, and it's about, you know, Chicago is famous for its mobsters, and, and not too long ago, a few years ago, we had this thing called the Family Secrets, where somebody, a son of a mobster, uh, talked, and the family being the Chicago out. It's, the, the mob here is called the Outfit, and it's this kid of one of the you know top outfit guys got caught, in, and he and his father had, and so he talked, and he brought down the whole show, and it was a big trial called the Family Secrets trial. So this is kind of based around that story, but there is a man, and he's old. He's like a 70, 72 year old guy named Vitus Gorski. But he's like six foot five. He's old, but he's still a, a murderous bastard. And he gets caught up in this thing, and somebody rats on him. And he's killing his way to the head mob figure who's being held, you know, in some kind of uh, protective custody somewhere. But he's working his way, and the cops are on the, you know, and he's killing. He, he you know, because once he murders the, his first two victims, he abandons his home because he knows he'll find. So every time he needs a place to stay for a night, he finds somebody and murders them, just sleeps and then steals their car in the morning. So there's this trail of bodies. But uh, it, it, it's really, you know, it's a, it's just such a great role. I mean, and there's two cops on the trail, obviously, two Chicago cops and the FBI is and everyone's involved and they can't find this guy because, they, they you know, they, they, he's an old man. <laughs> but he's still a force to be reckoned with, and he's huge. And, thought, and I'm thinking, well, who, who are we gonna, you know, who are we gonna get for this role? Because that's the, that's the real prize role. And you know, there's so many great actors in that, in that. And all of a sudden, I saw the other day, I saw a picture of Danny standing with his arm around Rutger Hauer, who's <laughs> I just looked him up. He's 72. Yeah. I, interesting idea. So yeah. thank you, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't, thought, yes. I hadn't thought of him until then. Yes, I know the photograph you mean, and, and Rutger Hauer is an, yeah, I, I've met, I was so starstruck when I met Rutger Hauer. I, he asked me to, to spell my name. He told me how Nicholas was spelled, and I just nodded. I was <laughs> like, I wasn't going to correct him. I was like, no, Rutger Hauer. But, you know, reading his biography, a very shy man, funnily enough. Um, no, uh, just a brilliant, absolutely superb actor. Okay, right. So, uh, glad we got that for Danny. Um, there's a 
couple of more films that I'd just like to touch on because people are asking about it. Um, thinking of uh, Wild Things, uh, you mentioned it was a studio film earlier on, but one question's coming from Mark McCauley. How did you find the amazing alligator, actor, alligator, wrestler for Wild Things? He was the, we had the big, you know, big, but a friend, uh, I think I actually, I met her on Wild Things, casting director. I think she was recommended by the studio. Her name is Linda Lowy. And I wound up working with her on a number. We, we became friends and we worked on numerous things. She's very good and a, a, a nice person to work with. But often when you go on location, you're, you know, you're, all your actors aren't coming from Los Angeles or New York. I mean, you're going to hire some actors locally. And we were in Miami. There's a lot of actors working in Miami. Uh, so we had a local casting director and she was very nice and she found us a lot, but that was Mark. She was, she was married to Mark, but she didn't tell us. She didn't want to think that there was nepotism involved. So she said, Oh, I know this actor who would be really good for this part. And she didn't reveal till after, cause he was perfect. Uh, he was a great, he was a wonderful actor, a really cool guy. And he grew up and, you know, it just seemed like if you grew up kind of in the swampy, uh, exurbs of Miami. Everybody wrestled gators when they were kids. It was just, <laughs> it was just common, you know? So <laughs> he was, uh, you know, he was, that was him wrestling the gator. He knew that, you know, it wasn't the first time. He was a skilled gator wrestler and a great guy. Right, 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 right. Yeah, there's a wonderful moment in, in the film as well. Um, and again, from Danny, uh, what was your experience working with Robert De Niro, Bill Murray, Irma Thurman, and David Caruso on Mad Dog and Glory. Well, it was pretty heady uh, times because, you know, I coming from, to, to get a phone call from a woman named Melanie Friesen, I, was, I had this big old loft on a street called Milwaukee Avenue, and that's where I ran my operation <laughs> and lived for many years. And it was a really cool place. It was old and funky, but it was it was big and and spacious and and a great place. Uh, and so anyway, I had this big old desk that I used to sit at every day. And uh, phone rang one day, and it was like, "Hello, John." And I go, "Who's this?" And oh, this is Melanie Friesen. Go, Hi, Melanie. Uh, what's <laughs> what can I do for you? She says, "Well, I work for Martin Scorsese." And I saw your film last night, Henry, and uh, I showed it or last week, and I showed it to Marty. Uh, and he really loved it. And he has a script he wants you to read. And I go, yeah, who is this now, really? You know, at this point. And goes, no, no, it's, this is, uh, Marty wants to talk to you. Uh, he's busy at the moment, but will you be available to talk to him in you know, 10 minutes, whatever it was? And I said, oh, no, no, I, I, you know, I'm going to the, you know, to the, to the bar, I get, you know, the gym. What? Yeah, of course I'll be there in 10 minutes. And you know, Marty uh, called me up. And said how much he liked Henry, and then said he would, you know, he was producing, and he had this script that he really thought was good. Richard Price wrote, who, a wonderful writer, and would I read it? And uh, I said yes, I would read it, and I read it, and it was a great script. And so, you know, we started the process, and I think all of those people couldn't have been nicer to me. Uh, and uh, Marty was always so solicitous. He goes, "Well, John, you know." Uh, Bob De Niro read the script uh, a while back, and he really likes it, you know, and he really, but I don't want to push you if you don't want him, you know, if you, you know, because if you've got somebody else in mind, but, but, you know, but Bob really likes this, so what do you, you know? No, I want uh, <laughs> Scott Bio. <you> know? <laughs> so, of course, you know, so they fly me to New York. I mean, I mean, again, I come from the south side of Chicago. I've worked in the steel mills. I've worked in the carnivals. I've worked, you know, in construction sites. I've worked in every goofy job you could think of. And all of a sudden I'm saying, I, you know, I went out and bought a brand new Armani suit uh, and <laughs> went to New York, took a plane. And I'm, so I'm ushered into Marty's office to meet Bob, you know? And so I, Bob comes, I'm sitting there with Martin Scorsese and Bob. And well, you know, well, we're really thinking about, uh, we had an idea for the Frank Milo. So he's coming back, boom, knock on the door. Who comes in? Cause he's considering Al Pacino walks in. He's worth, he, you know, there we're talking about you know you think you know, well okay and then we're sitting there and we're just having a wonderful time we're laughing it up you're swapping yarns and stuff 
And I'm thinking, we're in a pretty fast company here. I wonder who's next. So they knock at the door. I swear to, to God, it's George Lucas, who just happens to be in town, <laughs> dropping in to see Marty, you know. So I'm sitting there with Martin Scorsese, Bob De Niro, uh, Al Pacino, and George Lucas. And, you know, the conversation, then everyone's got to go where they got to go. I'm going, did that just happen? I went back to my hotel. <clears throat> I was just laying there kind of in a daze. The phone rang. It was a gentleman named Casey Silver, who was head of production at Universal Pictures. He was our boss. And he said, uh, well, John, you know, um, basically, are you sitting down? I go, yeah. He says, I've got some alarming news. Oh, what's that? He goes, well, what, basically what the news was, was Spielberg had convinced Martin Scorsese to direct Cape Fear, and they were going to take Bob De Niro uh, away from us and go make Cape Fear. But that, that then we, you know, but six, so what was a six month postponement. Uh, but it was still like, you know, you come off the, the great, one of the great highs of your life and pick up the phone, it's like, guess what? <laughs> and you never know, I mean, in six months it could turn into forever because, so anyway. But like I say, they, uh, all of them treated me, uh, Martin Scorsese was incredibly generous and kind. Bob was so solicitous and pleasant, pleasure to work with. Bill was a little wild, but he and I got along <laughs> pretty well and, you know, remain friends to this day. Uma was lovely. I mean, we saw every actress in Bob De Niro. Usually big movie stars don't read with the other actors. Bob De Niro read with 50 actresses, literally. And that Uma, I mean, that was a long winnowing process. Uma really won a, a, a major competition because we saw everybody in that age category working at that time, every beautiful young woman in Hollywood and New York. That's extraordinary. That's absolutely amazing. Because, I, I mean, she's absolutely pitch perfect for the part. And yeah, it's fascinating, absolutely I think, fascinating. I think, I think they were married to Gary Oldman. That sounds familiar. I'm sure we can Google that, Google that and find it out. <laughs> dinner one evening, he was in Chicago to visit her, and he was in character as Lee Harvey Oswald. That was a strange dinner. <laughs> he was, that's what he was working on at the time. That, I, 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 I've, I've seen him do a Q&A with Malcolm uh, McDowell when uh, Gary was uh, introducing um, uh, Clockwork Orange. Uh, a screening that they did, and I've not actually met him in person. But he's, yeah, very intense, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, he's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, really, really interesting fella. Um, there was one question actually, just moving back to Lansky, um, which again I really, really enjoyed. And technically, and you were working with the playwright, or I think of as a playwright, but obviously screenwriter as well, is David Mamet. And that was the number of flashbacks and the number of actors playing Lansky and the way you mel you melded all those together. How how did you approach that? Because it's it's genius as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it was, it was very interesting that I had done uh, Wild Things, which was pretty successful. I mean, it wasn't, I think it was number three picture, but, but you know, number one was Titanic. So the studio was, uh, was, was mad at Peter Guber, who was our producer, for the, and he was leaving Sony. So they, they as a revenge, they released the, our picture against Titanic. <laughs> so, so, so uh, the wild things. But, it, you know, it was number one in France. It was number one in Italy. It was number one in Spain. It was number one. But, you know, it's not going to be number one against Titanic. And uh, anyway, after that, I... Uh, I, you know, I'm ready to go to work again. And I have a good friend named Fred Zolo, who's a Broadway producer and a film producer. And he is or was married to, I, I don't know if they're still married or not, Barbara Broccoli, uh, you know, who is the Bond. Cubby, yeah, Cubby's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really, I really like Barbara. They, so I became very good friends with them. They're very social and always having parties and very much fun. Great group of people around them. Uh, and I had done uh, when 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 we hit, when Mad Dog and Glory was shut down. I, within a day or two, I got a phone call from Eric Bogosian, 
And he had a show called Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll. It was a one man stage show, just like talk radio was. Uh, and it was very successful. And uh, Frank Rich, who was the, was the uh, theater critic that everyone feared in those days, uh, just praised Eric to the skies. He was Eric's darling. Uh, Eric was his darling. And uh, so uh, the, Eric called and said, gee, you know, what do you, you know, I really love Henry and I love you, you know, blah, 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 but I'm doing, you know, the, he was getting ready to make a film. Uh, there was there was a couple million bucks uh, put up to make a film of sex, of sex, drugs, rock and roll. And the producer was Fred Zolo, who I didn't know, and his partner, Nikki Paleologos, and they had grown up with Eric in, uh, uh, outside, outside of Boston. And so I wound up working with Fred Zolo on, on that, on Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll. And we made that film in the interim. And when that was, because it was only a three day shoot, because we shot a live show three times. Uh, so it, you know, wasn't uh, a full year as a movie often takes, it was more like six months, which fit in perfectly to our downtime on Mad Dog and Glory, then went back and did Mad Dog and Glory, but became very good friends with Fred and Barbara. And as I say, in LA, I was, they were always inviting people over their beautiful house in Beverly Hills with this gorgeous yard and, you know, and a dining area out back and it's just fun, amazingly fun people would be showing up at those parties. So I got, you know, I was getting scripts after uh, Wild Things, and I, I just wasn't getting anything that I liked very much. You know, after Henry, I got all horror film scripts. Mm. After uh, Wild Things, I'm getting all these bad behavior in high school scripts, you know, and that's not quite what Wild Things, like I say, Wild Things to me is a very political film about class. Yes. Yeah. And who wins. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so Fred sent me a script and I, I, oh, I was supposed to be the director on David Mamet's American Buffalo film. And I love, you know, Mamet comes from Chicago and that, that method of speaking, that convoluted language that, you know, he used to sit in a coffee shop, particular coffee shop and just listen and write and write what he heard. And that, that you know, that really staccato convoluted type of dialogue. If you're from Chicago, it's not so indecipherable. Yeah, it's the way people talk here, you know, and I loved working with his dialogue because it was sort of second nature to me. But anyway, they, Fred sent me, uh, oh, oh, I was supposed to do American Buffalo and there was just this whole horrible political, this, there was a real backstabbing that went on and this other director wound up doing it. I had Al Pacino committed to do it because he'd done it on Broadway. We had a meeting, we got along great we were going to do American Buffalo. And I was really, it was one of the great disappointments of my career when that whole thing turned inside out. And Al Pacino would not work with the other director. I refused to work with him. And consequently, they got Dustin Hoffman, who we love Dustin Hoffman, but, you know, it broke my heart. And, it, you know, I, I, I don't think I ever even watched the film. Uh, so I won't say anything bad about it. But... Then this script comes from Fred Zolo, who I love. Fred's just really funny, and we really have fun working together. And his partner, Nikki Paleologos, they grew up together. Nick's dad was a judge in Boston, and Nick is very wired and, and still lives in Boston to this day. I think he's like the film commissioner of Massachusetts or something these days. But they, they were a producing pair, and they produced on broad, a lot of stuff on Broadway. And they were really fun and funny. And so it was just a lot of fun working with those guys. And... Uh, they had the Mammoth script and they sent it to me and I wasn't getting scripts that, that, you know, I cared much for. And I went, Jesus, it was just brilliant, you know, uh, brilliant writing. And, and that's sort of what I'm motivated, you know, the, give me a good script. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's what gets me interested. So this was a great script. So we, we wound up making Lansky and it just, you know, the cinematographer was John Alonzo who shot Chinatown and who shot Norma Ray and one of the greatest that ever walked. And, God, what a pleasure it was to work. Because I often butt heads with cinematographers, but not with John. I just, every day he used to wear these little uh, terry cloth caps. And every day I would see this little white hat marching onto the set and my heart would rise in my chest. John's here. You know, he was, God, was he good. And a pleasure of a man. Uh, and just a great group. Richard Dreyfuss, 
Uh, everyone was great on that. It was, it was except for HBO. Uh, <laughs> headbutts with HBO. You know, the, the, the point where, in, early in the film, where he kills the little, he, the little kid goes under in the pool in the mm -hmm. river. That was actually a swimming pool, but it was the East River. Uh, and you know, you you don't know who did it till late. And in the in the, well, the, the HBO executive, he goes, well, we have to change that. I go, why? He goes, you know, he's unsympathetic. Lansky is unsympathetic. He kills it, and I go, he's a fucking gangster for Christ's sake. You know, what do you expect him to be? A saying, you know. So I refused to do what they asked me to do. Uh, to cut that scene, I I blew it up a little bit. You know, as a compromise. So. I don't know what difference that made. It made it look more grainy is what it did, but that's about it. Uh, and I remember there was a woman executive I was working with at uh, HBO who I liked very much, but she happened to be on vacation when this crisis came down, when they were trying to get me to change the movie, to change the, you know, cut the scene where he, that was basically the heart of the film. That mm. was the scene at the end. This is how, you know, this is why he is who he is. It, you know, it, it sort of explained things and they want to cut it. And it's like, they say Hollywood will always take a knife and find, you know, decide, discern where the heart of your story is and try and cut it out, you know, for one reason or another. So I had a pretty big to do about refusing to do this. And, and I got pretty much got my way, but I didn't make any friends. And she came back from vacation and she was like, you know, saying, John, but why did you have to make such a big scene? And why did you have to be so different? called and blah 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 you know and, you know it's, it's, I said I'll tell you why because my name is on this picture forever and the, the guy who was running HBO at that time I said he is not going to be here next year she goes John you're so negative you're showing six months later he was gone you know and it's just like I can say your name's on it forever and everything you every time you you know you you gave in when you see it five years later, like I say, it's like an ice pick stuck into your kidney. You know, I didn't fight the fight. Now I, <laughs> my name's on this, and that should have been better. That should have been different. So, but if Lansky's, yeah, you can see that. All of a sudden, the grain gets a little bigger. <laughs> and <then that> <laughs> funnily, funnily enough, <laughs> now you pointed it out. Yeah, I kind of wondered about that. But it, I think what I found particularly interesting, and as I say, because it, you cover a lot of. What, four actors, three or four actors playing three. Lansky? Three, three actors. You've got the boy, and then you've got the, yeah, you know, the younger yeah. Lansky, and then... Max, oh, the wonderful actor who was in Drugstore Cowboy. I can't remember his last name. It starts with a P, but uh, just a really great actor. Yeah, yeah. But the, hey. the, you yeah. had so many time frames to deal with, and you've got the... And it's not just Lansky, of course, he grows up. You've got the three central characters um, of Lucky Luciano, Lansky, and Car oh, Bugsy, Bugsy Siegel. Um, uh, again, you've got great actors. What was that all, the way that, it is all beautifully handled. Um, was that just Mamet and the way that he'd written the script? Or did you just say, actually, no, this is how I'm going to be. How do you approach all those different, because I, mean, I have to say, one of my favorite transitions is you've got one actor going down for the wash base, base and you've got a different actor coming up. I don't remember how we thought that one up, but, uh, you know, Mamet had wrote a very nonlinear script mm. uh, uh, with all the flashbacks. And it, and it, and it was originally meant, it was, I think they're going to have, a, like, it was going to be made at Warner's for like $50 million. And uh, I think they had Alec Baldwin. I don't know who else they had lined up, et cetera. And if I was the executive at Warner's, I wouldn't have put $50 million into that script because it was too nonlinear. And, you know, you're not going to sell tickets. People are going to be confused. Uh, like what they did with Once Upon a Time in America, chopped it to bits the first time out. But they put it in turnaround and HBO picked it up and we made it for $11 million, which at the time was the most money HBO had put into a film. Uh, there was another writer, Vince. Uh, he had written... I think he written the Pope of Greenwich Village. He was a New York novelist, really a nice man. And <laughs> I don't know how, uh, what kind of language I, I, you know, I don't know if you need to censor this, what I'm going to, but it's something. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So Mamet, uh, Mamet's a very interesting guy. And uh, he, he was incredibly charming in my dealings with him. 
he's really smart and a wonderful writer, but he, you know, he has his, <laughs> he does things the way he does them, and that's, sorry, but that's it. So, he, you know, the original script, there was no way we could make that for $11 million. We had to, to you know, we got brought, you know, so they asked Mamet, the same guy that wanted the thing cut, who's long gone from HBO, uh, wanted the script rewritten, and he give, and, and if you take Mamet's original work and you want it rewritten, you have to pay him the same you paid him again, and then you have to tell him exactly what you want, and he'll just transcribe that. He will, you know, and so, I think there was a famous memo that he did, a letter he'd sent to the head of HBO, you know, they, he said, well, here's what I'm giving back, you know, and I know you probably won't, I don't remember, I, but it's, the, the last line I do remember quite clearly, though, and, and if you don't like it, you can suck my dick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we we had uh, Vince, and if you look up the Pope of Greenwich Village, the the Vince's last name is the guy that wrote the uh, wrote the book, the Pope of Greenwich right. Village, and, and really nice man, New York writer. <clears throat> so he did a lot of work on the script, uh, and he wanted to he, he wanted to make it much more linear. And I go, my opinion was, we got eleven million bucks. HBO is not selling tickets. You know, it doesn't matter. Mm. You know, we're not going to, I'm not going to lose it one way or the other. The better it is, the better it is. Uh, and it, it will not be, they won't make any more or less money, you know, if it's a more linear story, but not quite as unique. So I, I sort of opted to keep it very nonlinear as it is and associative because we could, you know, and and that's, you know, the reason it was the way it is, and working with those, you know, working, with, it was just such a wonderful challenge to have have to pick three actors for each of the roles. But I was thinking again, a Once Upon a Time in America, one uh, James Woods. When we were doing Mad Dog and Glory, James Woods was very hot to play uh, Bill Murray's part. So I had a long sit down with him, and he and uh, De Niro had worked together in Once Upon a Time in America. And he told me, you know, he knew that Leone was a genius director because Bob De Niro's got this little mole on his face. And when they made that transition from the kid to the adult, it was a similar thing. He's looking in the window and she's in, what's her name, He's dancing the kids. And then pull back, but the kid's got a mole here. And then pull back and, you know, and the mole connected, you know, it made the connection. Well, we didn't have a mole. Um, I don't think. I think we might have put something on one of their. Feet. Have, yes, you did. <laughs> that is one of the things. Is to, now, which one is this one? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, and it works. It works really, really beautifully. It's just, you know, it's fun. I, I love. I, I love stories that have the sweep of an entire life like that. Mm. That's what I love. Once upon a time in America, they start as kids, and they finish. You know, is is. Especially when De Niro comes back to New York and he's like twenty some years older, and he oh he has a, that look that when he you know he comes back to Moe's, the the deli where he you know so much of his youth was on, on the way up and now he's just been you know he says he's just been off in some the you know Yonkers or some place for thirty years and now he's an old guy and it was just so moving and I I, I love stories that sweep a, you know a, the whole of a life. Yeah, time. <laughs> yes. well, as I say, I, I really loved it, and uh, it, it's, it's quite amazing. And um, John, what a surprise! We've just spoken for about an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's been tremendous fun. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time out. Well, I hope uh, your uh, whatever they would be uh, watchers, listeners. Enjoy yes. it. Which is audience. 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 Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I, <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. So, like to be uh, it was great. I enjoyed doing it. And Good. I Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Well, right. um, uh, just before I say goodbye to you properly, I'd just like to let people know that next week's show um, is going to be one where uh, my audience of guests, um, I'd like to just Gus, the films of Vincent Price. Um, as most of you know, um, you can't really see it at the moment, but I've got Vincent Price stuff uh, everywhere. It's just huge.
influence on me growing up. Uh, it's next week's show. And then following that, uh, we have, he says, scrolling to the bottom, uh, on the 14th of August, Philip S. Scott and Craig Newman, the writers and directors of Cruel Summer, which is premiering at this year's Fright Fest. Uh, they're going to come and join me on the show as well. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody who's watched um, uh, and those of you who've subscribed to the YouTube channel, that means a great deal as well. Um, but most of all, John, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for spending the time with us. Well, my pleasure. And I'd like to, again, make one comment myself that uh, in late October, uh, MPI is re-releasing Henry, uh, 4K digital remastered. Uh, I, I don't know what, you know, mediums they're releasing it on. It will be a the first premiere will be Chicago and New York and LA. And I'll be trying to talk them into one in the UK. I mean, Henry was huge in the UK. And uh, yeah. I think it would make a lot of sense for them to have a screening in London. So we'll see. Well, if they do, then I'm definitely there. I am definitely cool. there. Yeah. Seeing that on the big screen would be, yeah, quite extraordinary. Absolutely. All right, All right then, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Cheers, John. Thank you. And good night. Goodbye, everybody.